Star Walker Studios presents Game Master's Journey, your multi-dimensional RPG podcast. Hello, fellow gamer. Welcome to episode 264 of Game Master's Journey. I'm your host, Lex Starwalker. On this show, we discuss the craft and the art of game mastering. I've been running RPGs for over 28 years now, and I produce this show in the hopes that you can benefit from my experience, my triumphs, and my mistakes. I've got a great episode for you today. We are returning to our in-depth discussion of the Dungeon Master's Guide for Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. Today we are finally to, uh, I think, the chapter of the DMG I've been most excited to talk about this whole time, which is Chapter 9, Dungeon Master's Workshop. And there's a lot of great and fun stuff to explore in this chapter. This is just a bunch of variant rules and optional rules that you can use to customize D&D 5th edition to exactly the kind of game and experience you're looking for. Um, And then towards the kind of back half of the chapter, there's a lot of help for homebrewing your own content, whether that's coming up with your own monsters or your own magic items or spells or player character options all that great kind of stuff. And I'm really looking forward to talking about uh, everything in this chapter, really. Uh, speaking of player character options, I just released a D&D supplement called Adventures of Primordia, which is full of player character options that I came up with for my game. So if you haven't checked out any of my D&D supplements, uh, please go to my website, starwalkerstudios.com, and check them out. I've got three now. I've got an adventure for d and And I've got Relics of Power, which is all about uh, creating magic items that scale and power with the player characters wielding them. And then Adventures of Primordia uh, is player character options. Things like new cleric domains, spells, magic items, backgrounds, that kind of stuff. So, you know, if you like what I'm doing here and you want Game Master's Journey to continue into the future, uh, one of the best ways to ensure that that happens is to support what I'm doing by purchasing one of my D&D supplements. So back to DMG Chapter 9, um, there's a lot of great stuff to talk about in here. And, you know, I, I guess I, I talk a lot about the variant rules and the optional rules and and um, was kind of going back with myself, uh, whether those are the same thing or different things. But uh, I, I think that they are because like a variant rule is a different version of a rule that's in the game. For instance, uh, rest mechanics, how long a short rest or a long rest takes. Um, you know, we have the, the basic rule, which is one hour for a short rest and eight hours for a long rest. But in this chapter, there are some variations of that uh, that you could try in your game. And then optional rules are completely new rules. Um, and let's see if we're going to talk about any of them today. No, we won't be talking about any optional rules today, I don't think. But next week on uh, episode 265, uh, we're going to talk about hero points, which is an optional rule. It's a whole new system to add into the game. So I guess there is a distinction between a variant rule and an optional rule. Now, whether I'm always going to use the terms correctly, probably not, but I'll try. So, yeah, you know, I really like this stuff because... You know, I I feel like the obvious thing with these variant optional rules is, you know, if you as a game master or a dungeon master have a a specific version of D&D from the past that that you really liked or aspects of various versions that you really liked or or you just kind of have your own vision of, of how you want the game to run, it's maybe a little different than what's in the player's handbook and the rest of the dungeon master's guide. These rules are a way that that you can tailor how your game runs to fit that vision. Um, And the other thing that's maybe a little less obvious is you can also use these rules to tailor the game for a specific campaign or adventure you want to run. You know, and, and Brett and I talk about some of these things where, you know, this may not be a rule you want to use across the board every time you run D&D, but for a certain campaign, some of these r- rules might be just the thing 
to really focus that campaign in on whatever themes you're wanting to explore or the the kind of game play that that you want to have because you know if you run a lot of D&D like like I do um every campaign probably won't be the same you'll have some campaigns that are more serious some that are more um lighthearted you might run one campaign that's like a gothic horror kind of thing and another campaign that's like high fantasy um so for these different campaigns one of the ways that you can really make a specific campaign different and unique is using some of these optional rules to really um, make the campaign pop. So I'm really excited to talk about this today. And as I already kind of hinted at, I think uh, Brett is going to be joining me and we're going to be going through this together. So this is going to be a multi episode series because uh, you don't want to listen to an episode long enough to go through this whole chapter all in one go. Um, not and give it the treatment that that Brett and I want to give it. Uh, so today we're going to be starting chapter nine, and today we're going to be talking about um, some basic guidelines for home brewing that's given at the beginning of the chapter um, to consider whether you're going to try some of these optional or variant rules, or whether you're going to come up with your own stuff. Um, Wizards gives us some some just very basic guidelines of here are some things to be aware of uh, when you're homebrewing. Then we're going to start talking about um, ability options like proficiency dice and then some skill variants, some different ways you can handle skills in the game, uh, including ability check proficiencies, background proficiencies, and personality trait proficiencies. And yeah, that's that's what we're going to talk about today. And like I said, this is going to be an ongoing series and, and we're going to get through all of chapter nine. So if there's a, a certain rule or variant or whatever in chapter nine that you really like or dislike, and it's not one that we're talking about today, uh, feel free to shoot me an email at gamemastersjourney at gmail.com and let me know what you think about your favorite or least variant, favorite uh, variant or optional rule. So without further ado, let's bring Brett on board and let's crack open that DMG. So, so yeah, today is chapter nine, the Dungeon Master's Workshop. So this starts out with a bunch of variant rules which are just um, optional rules. You can use them or not, kind of different ways to run the game. And then later on in the chapter, we get into stuff like creating your own monsters, spells, magic items, all that kind of stuff. So uh, something to notice here at the very beginning, they talk about kind of some guidelines as far as if you're going to try to use some of this stuff. So they say, consider uh, trying no more than one or two of these options at a time. So, I mean, this is assuming that you you kind of already have a campaign going, but that way you can kind of see how they work and and be able to kind of uh, judge the uh, the impact they're having, where if you try like five different things all at once, it's kind of hard to see. Which is failing, which is working. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know uh, when I used to work in biotech, you know, in our experiments, you're only testing one variable at a time because... <laughs> Otherwise, if something happens, you don't know which of the things made it happen. So it's the right. same kind of idea. Two kind of questions they give you to consider when you're thinking about a rule is, will the rule improve the game and will my players like it? <laughs> <laughs> Always something to consider. And, and then they suggest once you start using this new rule to get player feedback. Um, <laughs> right, right. And and I would I would even say, you know, maybe probably more than once, because if you keep using it, you know, the players' opinions may change after you've used it longer. They, you know, some benefits or disadvantages may come out that you didn't realize right away. That's a good point. Using it in different experiences, um, they might have uh varying effects that some people might not like in the circumstance after you've you've uh started using it. So for the so if, if you're if you're establishing a variant rule for the purpose of of completing this one scene or this one um, part of the game, and everybody seems to be on board with it, then you move on keeping that 
as as part of the rule structure going forward yeah. and it somehow affects how uh how the players interact or or uh, affects their skills or what they're able to do then then you got to keep that in mind and and make sure that that everybody's still on board yeah well one of the great things about having you on here brett is i don't feel like i have to read the book so much <laughs> <laughs> um, but there is one thing here I wanted to read, um, in this intro section, um, because I thought they made some good points here. They say, so these are just some cautions. So kind of as a general rule, when you're thinking of homebrewing stuff or coming up with house rules, these are some, some cautions that the folks at wizards are, are giving us. They say, beware of adding anything to your game that allows a character to concentrate on more than one effect at a time. I actually, you know what, let's just take these one by one. Sure. I, I think we could kind of discuss each of these. Um, cause this first one, this is something I've actually considered. Um, I've considered either magic items or, you know, I've always talked about in primordia. I want these ideas of like magical gifts. Like I mm -hmm. had this idea of magic, almost like a radiation. And as you use it more, it like mutates you. Oh, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wanted I to have like certain abilities that you would kind of get as you use magic over time. And it would just be like a level based thing for PCs. And one of the ideas I had was, well, one of the big limits for like a spellcaster is the whole concentration thing. Right. And wouldn't it be cool if there's some kind of thing where you could say, oh, once you get to 10th level, you can now concentrate on two effects instead of one. Um, but th right here, they're saying... This is something you probably shouldn't do. <laughs> right, right. And I'm trying to think of a valid reason not to. In play, it's it, it makes complete sense to me. You can only focus on one thing at a time. Yeah. Um, but that's not to say there I I've seen games where they where the DM forgets that you can still cast a, you can still cast another spell if you're holding a concentrated spell as long as it's not another concentration spell. Right. So I think that kind of takes care of the the double spell action. But so some of the some of I'm trying to think of spells right now that have concentration. Uh, um, like there, Shield of Faith is uh, polymorph, I think. Right. Um, haste. I can see where that a can lot get of the pretty op. Uh, uh, yeah, um, like Stone Skin. A lot of the more powerful buffs are concentration, and I think, um, or actually, I know because I've I've heard like Jeremy Crawford talk about it. One of the reasons that they have concentration is they want to avoid what we had in like third edition where you could just stack buffs on characters mm. kind of unlimited as long as they weren't the same spell. Right. You could, there was no real limit to how many buffs you could stack on a character. And so like your combats would be just rounds or minutes of real world time of <laughs> like just <laughs> casting all these buffs on everybody. And, right. And not only wasn't that like necessarily the best gameplay, but it was also a lot of stuff to track and it kind of bogged things down. So I think that's part of it is they don't, they, you know, part of concentration is to limit how many buffs you can stack and also limit the more kind of crazy powerful buffs like um, haste and uh, like uh, stone skin and right. vulnerability, like globe of invulnerability <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> Um, I think fly is concentration. Um, oh, yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. So so I think that's <laughs> yeah. one part of it, of, of why we want to think really hard before we let them concentrate on more than one. And I think maybe another part of it is just kind of a game balance mm -hmm. between the PCs and, and everything else in the game. Because I think that concentration thing is a limitation to like a lot of the monsters and NPCs too. Right, right. So it's like, well, if you're going to let your player characters concentrate on more than one thing, are you going to let the monsters and NPCs do it? And hmm. if so, is it going to be all of them or just certain ones? And if so, which one? Like, it just seems like it could become a huge can of worms really, qu really quick. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, of course, there is a loophole. Oh, what's the loophole? Um, I think I'm just looking. I'm scanning through the back of this really quick or the front of this. Um, but a loophole, if you, if you really want some of the players to be able to, to perform uh, double concentration or, or something that would otherwise require a concentration spell, I'm wondering if um, a fair 
loophole <laughs> would be to introduce um, magic items that have those that have those spells. Well, I I'm pretty sure I, I think this is something uh, Jeremy Crawford's answered in I think maybe the Sage Advice, but uh, magic items that cast concentration spells still require you to concentrate. Do they really? Yeah. So, okay. so yeah, they, they saw that loophole and they, they closed that. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. But yeah, yeah. So I, I don't know. I, can you think <laughs> Brett of any other like huge downsides to characters concentrating on, on more than one thing? Cause they're saying basically here, don't do it. <laughs> as right, strongly right, right, as right. they ever say that <laughs> they're saying, we <laughs> don't, don't think you should do this. <laughs> um, I actually, I, I do agree just for game balance. Um, it it's easier to track. It's more it just everything that we've we that you just pointed out. It's it feels like if you were to be able to concentrate, it, you know, from a story perspective, it seems like it wouldn't make sense to concentrate on two different things because I can't concentrate on one sentence yeah. at a time and much less two at a time. So um, the idea of having somebody holding something tw- like holding two different spells just story wise doesn't make sense to me it it just it it just sounds right that it should just be one concentration at a spell or at a time yeah yeah i agree and i just had a thought about the magic item thing hmm. i think one way you could make a loophole with the whole magic item thing is is i'm pretty sure if the magic item is sentient then the magic item can actually concentrate on the if spell. the magic item is the one casting the spell. Yeah. That makes sense. So like if if you want, for instance, if you if there's a, a specific spell you want the player characters to be able to use as a concentration spell and you want them to be able to use other concentration spells with it, you could put that mm. spell on a sentient item and then say, well, it's the item that's concentrating on that spell, not the character. Right. I think right, that right. would work. But yeah, normally if it's just an item that doesn't have its own intelligence and personality that the player character still has to concentrate on it even if it's coming from like the staff of the magi or whatever right i was um was it iron stones i think um as you load things into those uh, they talk about never mind that's not it there was a different stone i was looking at um where basically any spell you put into it it you still have to cast the spell so you're you're still the one controlling it so the concentration would be yours and not the not the magic item that makes sense yeah there's the uh what's it called the gem of seeing or something yeah that might be the one you're thinking of it's a gem that lets you cast a spell i think yeah it's like a uh spell uh like a spell storing yeah device i can't remember what it's called or or is it the ring of spell storing that you're thinking of (laughs) Oh, that could be that. That's can't be that. That's too obvious. Yeah, that's got to be something else. That'd yeah. be too easy. It can't be that. <laughs> but yeah, I think it. I think it was that one. <laughs> um, let's see. I'm looking at it right now. I don't see. I'm just skimming it, but I don't see it mentioning concentration. But they probably feel like they don't have to mention it with that one because you're still casting the spell. It's not like exactly. You're just pulling, pulling the power from that. Yeah, it's not like it. It's um doing it for you. But yeah, I think that's even not something that's in the in the books. I think that's something that Jeremy Crawford clarified in Unearthed Arcana about mm-hmm. the whole, you know, if it's a magic item doing the concentration spell, you still have to concentrate. Right. Oh, well. Should I try so... to find it in the sage advice or do we not care? <laughs> <laughs> no, we can we can live with that. We I can think. move on. <laughs> yeah. Unless somebody says, no, wait a minute. There's got to be some way. Um, no, I'm comfortable with that. I, I, I personally like the idea of only being able to concentrate on one at a time. Yeah. And, and really, I think with these variant rules, um, you want to, I think, try to avoid implementing a rule that's going to drastically change kind of the power curve of the game and, and letting your spellcasters concentrate on even just two spells at a time would, would drastically change that and and another thing to think about is the balance between for instance like a wizard and a fighter right and and we already know how much wizards outclass fighters at higher levels so if you let them concentrate on two spells at once 
you're just making that even worse. <laughs> yeah. No one's going to want to play fighters or rogues anymore. Right, right. Or barbarians or <laughs> in any class that doesn't have a bunch of spells. <laughs> um. So they, anything they else on concentration or? No, no, I'm, I'm good with that. All right. So the next thing um, that they recommend that you not do hmm. is override the rules for reactions and bonus actions right so so not allowing more than one reaction in a turn or not allowing more than one bonus action and i think i i'm i don't know i i think i've i've attached myself to the rules so much that these make sense to me yeah it, it seems like if if somebody has a has multiple bonus actions or multiple reactions it um it actually the reactions especially can be um, detrimental to to an encounter. They, you yeah. know, if if you have the if you have the ability to um, say take opportunity attacks or uh, use your shield spell, I think is a reaction. Yeah. Um, anything like that multiple times, then then you can see the the imbalance in that pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just. Um making a note here because i'm just thinking of kind of like what's behind these limitations like they're saying don't do this don't do that mm -hmm. um and i think i've just come up with probably maybe three maybe four kind of almost universal <laughs> like reasons behind these which is um pc to pc balance yeah so so like like the concentration, if, if we let you concentrate on more than one spell, well now, you know, part of the balance between the different classes, as much as there is, is concentration. So that's a limitation on the spell casters. So they're not too um, powerful compared to the non spell casters. And it's like, well, if you give them more concentration spells now, you know, there's an even bigger disparity between your fighter and your wizard or your cleric. Right. I think another one is PC versus NPC or monster balance. Mm -hmm. So again, with concentration, you know, the, the monsters are limited by that too. Um, and that might not work in your favor. If you have a DM who's going to start using that against you. Right. <laughs> and right. Then and that could be, that could be much worse than right. The, the monsters are getting more from it than you are. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. And, and also the reaction, same thing, you know, yes. um, because, uh, well, actually, so so the third is is just speed and ease of play, I think. Yeah. So so like the concentration, um, as soon as you have more than one concentration at once, like now it's more to track. It's more you you have more bonuses stacking, and and it just kind of slows things down a bit. And I know a mm -hmm. big design goal with fifth edition was to make speed of play as fast as possible, right? Because um, because yeah, like third edition in combat, you get so bogged down. <laughs> so so reactions and bonus actions i think i think all three of these apply too because some classes use reactions or bonus actions more than others um so if you suddenly say oh everybody can have two bonus actions in a round your classes that use bonus actions a lot are going to get more powerful and your ones that don't aren't Right, right. So I think like rogues use bonus actions a lot. So if yes. if you just gave a rogue two bonus actions, that rogue just got a lot more powerful because now he can fight with two weapons and mm -hmm. do his, you know, the, the thing where they can hide as a or withdraw as a bonus action or. Yep. Yep. So, yeah, um, that would kind of beef up the rogue a lot compared to like the wizard who doesn't use bonus actions unless they have a spell that uses it. Right. Um, and then speed of play, obviously, if people have more actions in a round, it, it slows things down, whether that's bonus actions or, or reactions. Right, right. And then um, take into account as the players get or as the characters get higher and higher in level, they're going to be picking up extra attacks. They're right. going to be picking up extra extra actions that they can do. And so so that's going to that's going to going to put a put a uh, it's going to break the balance. That's yeah. what I'm trying to say. And, and it's going to slow things down and it's going to be more for the DM and the players to like keep straight. Yeah. You know, it's hard enough remembering if you used your reaction in a given round, like if you get a chance <laughs> to, to make an opportunity attack, it's like, 
did I already use my action or can I, I mean, we've seen this in our games where sometimes yeah. you're, you're, you're like trying to remember, did I use my reaction or not? Or was that last round? So imagine right. if you had two reactions and have to keep track of, did I use one reaction or did I use two or was that last round or was that this round? Like it would, it would get really complicated. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's not a good thing. And then the poor DM who's got to worry about two reactions for every <laughs> monster or, or NPC in the combat no. or bonus no. action, same thing. So, right. Yeah, I think right. as we think about these, it's like kind of like, okay, I can see why they're saying this is probably not a good idea. <laughs> yeah, your first reaction is, well, why don't you want to get more powerful? Why don't you want right. to be able to do more in a in a round? But yeah, once you start breaking it down and you and you you go through the itemized, what's it going to mean down the road? What's it going to mean for each turn? Yeah, then yeah, it, it gets kind of sloggy. Now the final one here is one I've broken. In our I campaign, know, and I broke this. One. I know, and I I have a hard time defending this one. I like this one. I I don't like this rule. Um, um, so they're they're saying uh, magic item attunement. So yep. either just throwing that out the window, or increasing <laughs> the limit above three attuned magic items. I don't know that I would throw it out the window, but I would increase it. I've I've played around with the idea. I haven't done it, but I played around yeah. with the idea of of doing that. Um, back uh, also for the same reason that i just i just said when you first look at the the rules above you consider breaking those rules because you want the players to feel more powerful the players want to be more powerful you want it to be more exciting and you're trying to find ways to to do that um when you when you tack on concentration and and all of those that that can have some serious issues the only issue that i can think of with um waiving the the rule about how many attuned items you can have the only drawback as a dm that i can think of is that the characters could potentially be seriously op yeah 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 i'm i'm kind of i mean i've already obviously broken this rule in our <laughs> campaign um but in my defense, <laughs> I don't I don't know that I I read this specific where they're saying don't don't mess with magic item attunement. I, I don't know for <laughs> sure that I read that and saw that. But but I do know that whether I did or not, like I understood as a GM that this was a potentially game breaking thing to play with. Sure. Um, and I knew I know that in the play test, they played with different limits other than three and three was the number they, they settled on. You know, I think they tried, I'm not sure if they tried to limit less than three, but I know they, they experimented with more than three. Right. Um, I think maybe at one point it was tied to your proficiency bonus. Maybe I'm not sure about that, but, Oh, um, that would make sense. Really? Yeah. But, um, what was I saying? I, I just like, I knew it was potentially game breaking. So in my defense, the, the cases where you guys can attune to more than three items are either, um, sp well, actually at this point, they're kind of specific items. Like, right. like wall has a, a scabbard that specifically says, you know, this doesn't count against your attuned magic item limit. As long as one of the other attuned items is, is this specific magic sword. Like they kind of right. work together. Right. Um, so that was very limited. And then the other one is, um, spoiler <laughs> for the campaign. <laughs> um, but now that you guys have found out that your avatars, right. Um, you have, and I think I've told you guys this, I hope I'm not spoiling this for you, Brett, but, oh no. but you guys have, have a, an ability or a power called your divine raiment, which is certain items that are kind of part of your divine self. Like for instance, right. wall shield and yeah. those don't count against your attuned item limit. Oh, they don't? Um, no. And maybe that's what I haven't told you guys yet. But <laughs> That's good to know. And you can also, like, you can never, they can never be taken away from you because you can just summon them. Yeah. Even if you're on another plane. If someone, like, took took Wall's um, shield, threw it in a bag of holding, threw the bag of holding into a, a portable hole, and your shield went somewhere <laughs> on the astral plane, Wall would be like, so? And he'd just snap his fingers and his shield's back. Because it's part of I his would, divine being. You can't like yes. separate him from it. And then he'd beat him in the face with it. So, you know, at least if this does turn out to be game breaking, it's not something that any other player characters will be able to use because they're not going to be avatars. 
Right. So it'll be this one. And, and, you know, honestly, <laughs> if avatars end up being OP, I'm kind of okay with that. <laughs> well, they're avatars. Yeah. And it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of in the description, right? And all of the player characters are avatars. So at least amongst you guys, it'll be hopefully balanced. Right. Right. You might be OP so compared game, to everything else, but. <laughs> so, well, the game itself then would be, it, it would be more balanced. It would, and it, it adds, it doesn't necessarily add, add more I guess it does add more power, but it um, it keeps it balanced and it it is a good, mm, an interesting way, maybe not a good way, that's debatable, <laughs> but it, it's a way to to allow the characters to basically take on more or harder encounters and, and harder experiences than they normally would at the levels that they're at. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And... The other thing for me about the attunement limit where I feel like this isn't necessarily as much of a no-no as the other ones mm -hmm. is it, it's going to be something I think that's really not going to come into play until higher level anyway. Right. Because even if you say, hey, you guys can attune to four items, um, by the time a, a given player character has four attuned magic items that are powerful enough to to break the game, they're probably going to be pretty high level anyway. Right. And high right. level characters kind of break the game anyway. <laughs> it's kind of what they do. Oh. I mean, once you can cast wish, I mean, or divine intervention with a hundred percent success rate, like, are yeah, you really okay, worried yeah. about how many attuned magic items you have at that point? That could be your wish. <laughs> yeah. That'd be a great wish <laughs> or, or a divine intervention. I want to attune to four items. <laughs> right now another way i have gotten around this is homebrewing magic items that combine like say two different items into one right and and i think this would be a good way to approach it if you want to play with this and maybe see if it really is broken is instead of saying hey you guys can all tune to four items take two uh, magic items you want a player character to have that require attunement and create a magic item that just combines those two items into one item, give the player that sure. item, and you've effectively increased their attunement li limit and see what happens. And then if it does break the game, you can just take that item away. <laughs> 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 or have it split into two items or something. Ooh, well, that'd be a good story. Because I could see another aspect of this, like I guess a counter to my thing of, well, it's not going to matter to a higher level is, well... Maybe you've got four player characters and they each have a decently powerful attuned item. They could give all those items to one character. And now you've got this crazy OP character who's maybe only like seventh level, but he's got four like <laughs> very rare attuned items. And, and that might be hmm. that might be something you don't want to happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess I, that's the main that's the rule that's that's the thing that dms always have to to watch for is does it scale yeah is it um yeah is it scalable and does it as it as you get higher up does it break yeah that's but another thing to think about is well even if you've got four badass attuned magic items you still only have one action one reaction one bonus right. action so it's like how much damage can you really do you you can't probably use them all in one round unless they're they're like things that don't require actions to use they just give right. you like static bonuses or something hmm. i don't know so so yeah i guess break that rule at your peril <laughs> <laughs> break it see what happens yeah and i'd love to hear from anyone who's broken any of these guidelines you know maybe you've allowed multiple bonus actions or or more attuned items you know, how, how'd that turn out for you? <laughs> like, I feel like messing with the number of reactions, bonus actions, like that would definitely, I feel like eventually lead to results you're not going to like, but the attuned item thing, I'm not so sure about. Yeah. Especially if you wait till higher level to give it to them. Like you guys didn't, you guys only now got that and you're what, like ninth level now, 10th level, eighth, something like that. Eighth or ninth. Eighth, yeah. Yeah. So at least it wasn't at first level. It's like, hey, you guys can attune to four items. <laughs> and I think you all only have one item that's part of your your divine raiment. So right. it's really only increasing it by one. 
It'd be different yeah. if you had three magic items that were legendary and part of your divine raiment. It's like, oh, so I can actually attune to six items. Like that would be insane. That'd be like demigod level, I think. <laughs> yeah, that would be over the top. I don't yeah. think that's a good idea. Yeah. So I won't. Um, do that. <laughs> <laughs> but as the, I was thinking, as the DM, you can also. I mean, ultimately, you're in control of of what you give the players. You're you can you can give them as many magic items as as you see fit and control it that way yeah and and what items you give them because exactly you know there's a big difference between a staff of the magi and right like a quarter staff plus three or whatever (laughs) so so not following this rule might not necessarily play along well with um if you are if you're prone to roll on the magic item lists yeah. to hand out, hand out, um, uh, what are they called? You know, those things, presents, not gifts, treasure, uh, treasure. There you go. Loot. <laughs> Loot. Um, <laughs> if you're, if you're prone to, to roll randomly, then that might cause an issue, but yeah. Um, yeah. If you're rolling a bunch of like crazy powerful items. <laughs> yeah. In my right hand, I have a Holy Avenger. <laughs> In my left hand, I have the a... The Vorpal Sword. Yeah. How'd that, how'd that get there? I'm dual wielding. Mm. Isn't this awesome? <laughs> yeah. At that point, you just throw away the rules. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think uh, it sounds like we both agree that these are, are probably good guidelines to follow. Um, and, yeah, they say, you know, changing any of these can seriously unbalance or overcomplicate your game. <laughs> so it's one or, you know, one or the other or both. Like, I feel like the bonus action reaction thing, it's more of an overcomplicating your game than unbalancing, maybe, especially if you're yeah. going to apply it across the board to the monsters, too. Right. I mean, it may not unbalance the game, but it's definitely going to make your life a lot more complicated. Yeah. Yeah. And really not not much fun when you're playing. No, it, like the cost benefit analysis that would, <laughs> would not hold up there. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, well, now that we've kind of gone over that, we can start talking about some of these these variants. So first, we've got various uh, ability options. And the first one here is uh, proficiency dice. So this, in a nutshell, is instead of having just a proficiency bonus, like, you know, first to fourth level, your bonus is plus two you would have a proficiency die instead. So uh, first or fourth level, you'd have a D4. So anytime in, you'd have a proficiency bonus, instead of adding the bonus, you're rolling a D4. Mm, yeah. So this is one I've considered using before. I've, I've never actually tried it. What are your thoughts like, on this one? I'm, I'm in the air. Um, I like the idea of adding more randomness to your rolls. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not too keen on adding more randomness to my rolls though. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's kind of funny when, when I, I started thinking about these, these uh, variant rules, I, I was like, well, let's think about possible pros and cons. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and for the proficiency dice I have, uh, will make your rolls more random. And I have that as pro and con. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. Could be either. Um, <laughs> will give you more dice to roll and to add up again, pro yes. or con. I mean, rolling more dice is more fun, but it's going to take more brain power and more time to add all those dice up. Right. Right. Players um, like me who, who just love math. Yeah. Um, are, are, it's going to slow them down. Yeah. yeah it's going to, sure. yeah, it's going to slow the game down for sure. And then, yeah. in and, and then, so again, what do we do with the monsters? I, I think what they're saying oh. here is the monsters would still get the proficiency bonus, but I feel like that might unbalance things a little bit in the monsters favor because I feel like getting a flat plus two bonus is probably better overall than having to roll a 1d4. Yeah. Because your monsters are going to be consistently getting a two where your PC could get a one, two, three, or four. Right. So... Yeah, um, th- this is one that when I first read it, I thought it was really cool. But the more I thought about it, the less I wanted to use it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just to go through it. So uh, level one to four proficiency bonus plus two, your proficiency die would be a D4. 
Uh, level five to eight bonus plus three, your die would be a D6. Level nine to 12 bonus plus four, your die would be a D8. 13 to 16th level, your bonus would be plus five or a D10 proficiency die. And then 17 to 20th level, uh, instead of a plus six proficiency bonus, you'd be rolling a D12. Yeah, it says here, um, this final paragraph under the proficiency dice, it says this option is intended for player characters and NPCs who have levels as right. opposed to monsters who don't. So that right. can seriously um, unbalance it. In, yeah, and I yeah. feel like it gets worse at higher level. Yeah. Because it like second level rolling a D4, like it's like, well, if I had a proficiency bonus, I get a plus two. Right. If I roll, I, I could get anywhere from a one to a four. And it's like, well, if I roll a one, it's only one worse. It's not that big of a deal. Where if I roll but then a you four, get to yeah yeah exactly. and when you get to level seventeen and it's where you would normally have a plus six and yeah. you roll a one that would then suck. yeah that's the difference between a hit and a miss or even a two three or four would still suck pretty bad yeah and yeah. I don't know if that would be if that would if it would make up for it that occasionally you might roll a twelve or a ten hmm. I think I personally I'd rather have the bonus that I can count on and I know what my bonus is <laughs> yeah yeah. And yeah, you know, I always, I always come at it from, from what does it do for the story or, or sure. what, uh, or, or the justification, you know, in the in-game player justification for it, it makes the proficiency bonus makes sense to be a staple. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's something that you've worked on. It's something that the character is trained, trained with, trained for, they've become proficient with things, hence the name. And so it's, it's that bonus that can be counted on and then the role is the actual skill yeah i i totally agree i mean we we've already got the d20 role for randomness to to show like fate or whatever right and and right. i feel like something like a proficiency like that's training that's stuff that you know like i i just feel like having that be random too doesn't it didn't from a story's perspective it doesn't really make sense to me right right i agree no well, more. it sounds like we're in agreement on on that. Um, it seems like it's, uh, yeah. I feel like there's a reason why they didn't do this for the actual game, for the actual rules. Yeah, and I, I feel it's, that way about a lot of these variant rules. Yeah. It's kind of like, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm glad this wasn't what they went with. Um, yeah. The, really, the only positive I can see for the proficiency dice is just you get to roll more dice. Yeah. But I, I feel like you get to roll plenty of dice in this game anyway, between right. advantage and disadvantage and, um, you know, your damage rolls and everything. I mean, you're going to get chances to roll lots of dice. So. Yeah. And it's not enough to make it a, well, no, that's, that's a counterpoint it, because at higher levels, it does make it, make it more, uh, dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. I feel, I don't know. I, I, I feel like it would kind of be a pain for the GM too. Because yeah. like, if, if you think about it, like high level, they're rolling a D12 for their mm -hmm. proficiency. Like you don't know what the player character is going to roll either. Like there's. Right. So you can't plan for it. You can't yeah. plan for. Well, it, some people might think that's a better thing um, where, you know, the, the encounter, the opposing character, whether it's a bad, bad guy or, or whomever, um, there's a stronger chance of if you're sticking to the rule, if you're sticking to the roles, there's a stronger can't chance that the uh, the being you're you're encountering who is not rolling that proficiency die, who they're you know they're maintaining that that stat for themselves. There's a chance they can get the upper hand on the on the player characters. Yeah, a I mean, stronger chance. Yeah, because this is going to apply to all your attack rolls, all your saving throws. So think about like, I oh, don't know. saving throws, right? Yeah. Think about like an 18th level character. You've got an 18th level PC and you're in a combat with a, with the proficiency bonus. Um, let's just assume you have no bonuses from anything else mm -hmm. like abilities or magic items or whatever. The right. lowest you could roll would be a seven if you roll a right. one or an eight if you roll a two, but on a save or an attack. But if you're, if you're using the proficiency die, you could roll a two. <laughs> <laughs> No. Yeah. And, and I don't feel like that's, um, the, the negative of that is outweighed by the fact that you could possibly roll a 32. Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, at that point you're kind of like, 
I mean, I've, I've, I don't think I've seen an armor class higher than 30. So Mm-mm. the 32 isn't going to do you any better than the 30 will. <laughs> I mean, so yeah, I think, I think it might be fun at low levels possibly, but I think at higher levels, your players are going to be like, can we go back to the proficiency bonus? This sucks. <laughs> Yeah, it, it'd just be so hard to plan encounters or have any idea of will this be a threat or will this be too much because it, right. there's so much randomness in there. Right. Yeah, not a fan. I agree. Nope. <laughs> okay. We don't need to do that then. Yeah, this is one I'd love to hear from people if you've tried this in a game, how, how it shook out. Yeah, and if it worked. Yeah. I want to know if it worked. All right, now we've got skill variants. So these are these are alternatives to the skills as we have them in the game. And the first one is ability check proficiency. So with <laughs> this rule, instead of having there'd be no skills in the game at all, and instead each character has a proficiency in two of the six ability scores, so strength, dex, con, etc. Um, one mm. of those is tied to their class. So they give a, a chart here of you know, each class and what ability they give. So barbarian, they could pick strength, dexterity, or wisdom. Bard, they could pick anyone. Uh, Cleric, intelligence, wisdom, or charisma. Druid, intelligence, or wisdom. Um, Ranger, strength, dex, wisdom. So so it looks like everybody gets at least a few to or a couple to pick from. Um, So they get one from their class, which you take from this table here. And then they get one from their background, and right away, a drawback with this, they don't give you any guidance whatsoever on the background. So it's up to you as a GM to decide <laughs> what ability they could get from each background, which right there, that's more work than I want to do. <laughs> um, so yeah, so so basically, like, let's say you're playing a rogue, you could have proficiency and dexterity. So any role involving dexterity, you get your proficiency bonus. So let's just stop there before we even get into like how they would handle expertise. Um, just thinking about that. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess the obvious advantage to that is it seems like you'd probably get your bonus to more things because mm, true, because you're not specifying, right? You're, um, you're not narrowing down the skills that they're going to be using. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah. Cause like if you're a rogue, you know, you might, you're probably not proficient in every dexterity skill. Right, right. Where with this, you would effectively be proficient with anything involving dexterity. Hmm. So I feel like in that way, it might be better, maybe. It would be, it'd be more adv- advantageous for the, for the players. Um, but one of the, I, the drawbacks just, is, yeah. and I think they point this out later, is it's going to make the characters much more similar. Especially right. like if you have two rogues in the game, they're probably going to have the exact same proficiencies because they're both right. going to pick decks. I mean, why wouldn't they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I don't think I'm too keen on this one, but no. it's. I think it's it's there for for simplifying for simplifying the rules for for possibly making it a little bit easier in gameplay and giving more bonuses um, than you would ordinarily have. But I think that I. Th- I think it waters it down a little bit too much. Yeah. And, and the fact that wizards didn't do the work to tell us the background proficiencies and they leave <laughs> that up to the GM. Right. Um, I think that negates any advantage as far as making things easier because yeah, it's like, well, now the GM has to sit down and think about every single background that a player character has, what ability they're going to get and probably right. give them a choice of more than one. And then you look at um, how expertise would work with this. They say the expertise feature would work differently than normal. At first level, instead of choosing two skill proficiencies, a character with the expertise class feature chooses one of the abilities in which he or she has proficiency. Selecting an ability counts as two of the character's expertise choices. If the character would gain an additional skill proficiency, that character instead selects another ability check in which to gain proficiency. So it's just, it gets really complicated and you don't, so you, it sounds like to me, like you don't get any bonus from expertise until you have expertise twice because you have to select the ability twice. And then now suddenly you have expertise in everything related to that ability. 
Oh, geez. Yeah. So it's like, if okay. I'm a rogue, I have to wait. I, I don't even get a benefit from it at first level because I have to wait until I can select it twice. But then once that happens at whatever level you get your second expertise, now you're, you have expertise with every dexterity skill you can imagine. Hmm. So it, it like, it goes from underpowered to overpowered and <laughs> no in really between. Really fast. Right. Yeah. Right. So yeah, I think this one's a mess. I, I think this one should have stayed on the cutting room floor. I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it says here even, it says this option removes skills from the game and doesn't allow for much distinction among the characters. Yeah. So I, I mean, you could, I'm, you could theoretically end up with a group of PCs where everybody has the exact same proficiency. Yeah. And that would be oh, a drag. That would, <laughs> <laughs> that would be a drag. Any more, anything else to say about that one, bro? No, no, I, you, no, <laughs> no, I don't want it. I don't want it. All right. Um, so, so next is background proficiency. Um, this reminds see. me of uh, 13th age, I think has a similar system. Oh, really? So, so this basically in a nutshell, again, you don't have skills. Instead, you get to apply your proficiency bonus to anything that would be covered under your background. Oh, so let's see. I feel like this yeah. is going to, they, they claim it won't, they specifically claim it won't, but <laughs> I think this is going to slow your game down because you're going to have players always making a case for why a given role should fall under their background. Oh, where now so this is, yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. This is going to be, it, it's going to be heavily reliant on what the characters come up with, with their backstories. Right. Yeah. And, and that's how, um, backgrounds work in 13th age is, you know, if you have the background blacksmith, if you can make a convincing argument of why this thing you're trying to do, being a blacksmith would make you better at it, then you get to add the bonus. So it's a lot of hmm. debate, I feel like, where with the skills, it's like you're either proficient in the thing or you're not. It either applies or it doesn't. And yeah, there's going to be times where you could make an argument of, oh, I should be able to use um, sleight of hand for this. But it's going to happen a lot less often than with the background thing, I feel like. Yeah. And, and you know, players, I mean, they're going to try to get as much mileage out of that background as they can. So they're going to well, of course. always be pushing the limits of, of what this can apply to. And you're going to have to constantly be making judgment calls and remembering for the future, okay, how did I rule on this? Right. <laughs> no... And then again, so what, yeah, go ahead, bro. Uh, so what would be the benefit to this? What would help? What would, if somebody wanted to try using the, the background proficiency instead of, um, instead of these, the ability checks? I don't know. I, if you have players that really get deep into their backstory, um, I could see this rewarding that because the more developed your backstory is, the more, things you're going to effectively get your proficiency bonus for. Um, right. But really, I mean, that's the only thing I can think of. And and I only see that as a benefit is if every player at your table is like that. Because if you have some players that, that really go deep into that and others that don't, then the ones that don't are kind of getting screwed over by this a little bit. Yeah. And, and I don't, I don't think I like that because I don't no. feel like, it should be a requirement to play in D and D that you have to write a six page backstory if you don't want to. <laughs> and I don't think it's fair to give the person that does that, like all these advantages that the person that doesn't, I mean, they're already getting advantages because you're going to have more to pull in. Exactly. Are, you know, yep. to give them like mechanical advantages on top of it. I think you're really like, you're basically telling that player that can't or doesn't want to develop a six page backstory. Like, I, I value you less <laughs> at my table than the yeah. Other. I feel like that's no, I don't like doing. that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's not what it's intended to be, but it yeah, because yeah, we all know there are there are different different characters who who are comfortable doing some things other over others. Some people prefer the RP. Some people like writing it down. Some people are just bare bones. Yeah, uh, the character will develop as they play. And what do you do with the player character who part of their concept is they have amnesia and they don't have it. They don't know what their backstory <laughs> is. So they don't get proficiency no, in anything. <laughs> no bonuses. No bonuses at all. That's the drawback. <laughs> Anybody with amnesia can't do shit. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, I mean, 
I think in a lot of my D&D games, I've had a, a pretty wide spectrum as far as what players give me for backstory. Mm-hmm. I'll have one player that will give me a ton, of, like a freaking novella. <laughs> and then I'll have another character that gives me nothing. Right. And so in this system, there'd be a pretty huge difference as far as, you know, what they get to use their proficiency bonus for. Yeah. And then also, this also screws up expertise. So the last uh, paragraph under this, they say, if a character has expertise, instead of choosing skills and tools to gain the benefit of that feature, the character defines aspects of his or her background to which the benefit applies. But again, like it's so arbitrary and subjective, like what qualifies as an aspect, like how granular. Wow. You know, because you could have one player who's really clever and they come up with an, a quote, an aspect of their background that actually would apply to all kinds of things. Yeah. And another player comes up with one that's very specific and will hardly <laughs> ever come into play. Well, these examples that they give in the book are pretty, uh, pretty specific. They say, uh, following the, the, the example of the noble again, the player might decide to apply expertise to quote unquote situations where courtly manners and etiquette are paramount. That's pretty specific. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. D- depending on the campaign, that could be something you use all the time or never. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I don't know. It's just too up in the air for me. It's so, yeah. Yeah. I wonder if it's because of the way we play the game that it, it doesn't sit well or it, it doesn't feel right. Yeah. I don't know. I, you know, like I said, this is how 13th age does it. And I remember when I've read about this in 13th age, I I was, I never liked it. I was like, this sounds mm. like this is just going to cause problems or, <laughs> or at the very least, we're going to spend way more time at the table talking about this than I want to spend. Right. Like right. players making cases for why, you know, my background as a potter should apply to the situation, <laughs> you know? <laughs> You're right. And, and like, how, how much can I bullshit the DM today? What can I get him to, to swallow today? <laughs> <laughs> and then you have to feel like an asshole if you tell him no. Right. Especially right. if you have a player that's constantly like crossing that line and you're constantly having to say no. Because I, I know you and I both, Brett, we like to say yes. And, and mm-hmm. we wouldn't be happy if we were constantly having to tell a certain player no, because they're always like going too far with how they want to apply this. Right. And this opens it up for abuse very easily. Yeah. Yeah. And, and possible conflict between players and GMs. If the players don't agree with how you're ruling on that. And players versus players. Yeah. If, if the other players don't feel like that's fair, what they're, what they're able to do and, and theirs doesn't seem to match up. I feel like this was like a, a nod to 13th age like this was for maybe people who play 13th age like hey you can play D just like 13th age here you go <laughs> but yeah i don't i don't know hmm. well i know um uh john marvin he's been on the show before and he's i think going to be in our numenera game uh, oh yeah he runs and plays a lot of 13th age so i'll have to pick his brain about the whole background thing or or if anyone else wants to write in who uses this or plays 13th age or another game like this like maybe it's not as bad as we think i don't i don't know i i think it would depend a lot on your players yeah i could see this working great for one group and being a train wreck for another group <laughs> just depending <laughs> on the personalities involved right right hmm. that's actually a really good segue to the next one Personality traits. Personality traits. traits. <laughs> uh, you want to tell us about that one, Brett? Oh, sure. So this is another variant rule where the the uh, characters don't have skill proficiencies, but uh, instead of that, they can add their proficiency bonus to any ability check directed directly related to the character's positive personality traits. What about their negative personality traits? Wouldn't that be fun? Yeah. Well, that might Sorry. be a penalty, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so for example, they say the uh, character with a positive personality trait of quote unquote, I, I never have a plan, uh, but I'm great at making things up as I go along. They might be able to apply a bonus when engaging in some off the cuff de- uh, deception to get out of a tight spot. So it's, so it's adding that proficiency bonus, not necessarily for this, um, for the skills, but for the actual the way you want to portray your character, right? The way yeah. you want to play them or her. And and then at the very end of this, they also suggest that if you wanted, you could also tie it to their <laughs> ideals, bonds, and flaws. 
<laughs> nice. So, okay. In, just in case you don't have enough loosey goosey stuff to worry about. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I I feel like this is kind of the same as the last one, like the same kind of pros and cons. I feel like. Yeah, I can. Uh, yeah, same. I can see where that. I can see elements where this can come into play, where it, where it makes sense. So let's say you have a personality trait where, where your character is paranoid. Yeah. Um, you can use that bonus for, uh, for intuition, for, for not intuition. What's like, yeah, intuition and, uh, deception, um, you know, things, things along that spectrum. Um, yeah. that, that makes sense. Kind of. I wonder if that would still, I feel like this would have less of a debate back and forth because it, it seems like they should be more cut and dry, but maybe not. I, I feel like you would, it would have less application in the background. Like, I feel like yeah, if your bonus was based on your background, you'd find more times to use that than based on a personality trait. I could be wrong. I don't know, but it just seems No, I can way. see that. Yeah. Um. So, I mean, maybe a little less opportunity for abuse in that way than the background thing mm -hmm. but it's still going to be a lot of argument and and by argument i mean making a case to the dm like this is why i should be able to use this instead of i have this skill this skill applies i roll you know right 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 <laughs> it's much more subjective where i feel like the skills it's pretty clear is this perception or not or is this sleight of hand or not where <laughs> if my personality trait is um, I love being around people. Like <laughs> I could apply to so many things. Yeah. It could just know. be any charisma check. And especially since you can create your own personality traits, it'd be different if we had a list to choose from. Right. That's right. Yeah. So you're going to have the players that try to come up with personality traits that are as open-ended as possible <laughs> so they can apply that as much as possible. And, and I remember from reading um, the 13th age book, getting back to like the background thing, mm -hmm. you know, that was something they talked about is they're like, be on the lookout for players who try to come up with backgrounds that are too broad because they're trying to, to think ahead of what they're going to apply this to. But, right. it, but it really puts that on you as a GM. Like you have to figure that out. Like what's too broad, what's too narrow. Like, right. They, so that they creates can't more tell you that, you know? Yeah. It creates more of a, uh, a window for conflict later. It's yeah. Yeah. Does it sound like we're fans of any of these? So far? <laughs> <laughs> not yet. I know I'm a fan of some of these, but not, not the ones we've talked about yet. Well, and I don't know that that's necessarily unusual because yeah, I think a lot of these variants, uh, they either come from older editions or possibly other games like 13th age, or they're different ways they tried it during the play test that were ultimately rejected. So that makes sense. You know, it, it's probably not unusual that a lot of them were like, yeah, this sounds cool at first. But when you think about it, like, I don't think I'd want to use it. I see a lot right. of problems potentially. Hmm. Anything else about the personality trait thing? No. All right. No. So next. Oh, oh, multiple yeah. personality trait. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, that's all I'm saying for that. Your your uh, yeah. your uh, multi multi personality disorder characters are now way OP. <laughs> <laughs> They're proficient in everything. <laughs> yep, yep. Expertise everywhere. At least at certain times, right? Not all right, at once, right. but <laughs> no, no, no. But they can flip on a dime. So yeah, fine. yeah, sure. All right, well, we're going to put a pin in chapter nine for now, and we will resume this discussion next week in episode 265. I want to thank Brett for coming on with me today and talking about the DMG with me. And yeah, we're having a lot of fun doing this. Hope you're having fun listening to it and really hope that, you know, you're you're getting some inspiration for your games uh, maybe some of these options that that you weren't aware of or or hadn't considered, maybe one of these will be the perfect fit for your campaign and, and what you're trying to do uh, right now or or what you're planning to do in the next game that you run. So uh, yeah, you know we're really curious to hear what you all think about these various rules that we talked about today. Um, if you agree or disagree with with our opinions on them. 
Um, anything you have to offer to the conversation, I'd, I'd love to hear it. You can shoot me an email at GameMastersJourney at gmail.com. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter at Lex Starwalker. Probably not the best way to uh, uh, contribute to the show uh, just because of the character limit. And uh, tweets tend to get lost. Uh, so so definitely if you have something to say that's important, I'd email it to me. Um, but Twitter is a great way to just keep up on what I'm doing. And and I tweet whenever I release a new episode. So, you know, it's a way to to keep abreast of, of what's going on. And uh, finally, you can call my voicemail, 951-GMJ-LEX-1. That's 951-465-5391. And you can join our communities on MeWe and Discord. Uh, so there's a lot of great ways you can get in contact with me and also connect with other listener GMs, share ideas, tell stories, all that great stuff. And again, if you enjoy the show and you'd like to help keep Game Master's Journey going, a great way to do so is to check out my self-published D&D supplements. You can find those at StarWalkerStudios.com. And another great way to help support the show is to become a patron. Patrons get their own private RSS feed, which includes all of the episodes of Game Master's Journey, as well as GM Intrusions. Um, so that's well over 300 episodes of RPG content for you. Um, my hosting provider limits my RSS feed to 100 episodes. So that's why the feed that most of you are subscribed to only has 100 episodes in it. Um, nothing I can do about that, but my patron feed is unlimited. So if you become a patron at the $5 level or higher, uh, you get access to that feed and all the episodes are on there. You can go all the way back to episode one, or you can go even further back to episode one of GM intrusions, which was a precursor to this podcast, very similar content, only a uh, more focus on Numenera where this podcast, at least in recent years, has been more focused on D&D. So I hope that you have a chance to play your favorite RPG this week. I hope you have a chance to run your favorite RPG. I'll be back soon with another episode of Game Master's Journey. Until then, game on. This has been a Starwalker Studios production, your source for quality gaming and hobby podcasts. This episode's music, courtesy of Cloudwalker, Transboy, Renfield, Stanko, and Ish. See the show notes for more details at starwalkerstudios.com slash Game Master's Journey.